Please turn in your Bibles to the book of Jude. And as you get comfortable there, I just want to thank you again for the privilege of being here with you for this weekend conference. I think once we get finished in our studies, every time we open our Bible, it's going to fall open to the book of Jude. That's what I'm hoping. And I know many of you have been reading Jude ahead and just saturating your minds and your hearts with the truths that are in this wonderful yet very brief book. And today we're going to be looking at Jude specifically, as our brother mentioned, exposing false teachers. And as I mentioned last night, we don't call their names, but we look at what they speak and what they teach. And this is the way that God's word as the light shines its light to expose that which is error by showing us that which is truth. And so we're going to read this morning in the book of Jude, chapter 1, verses 5 through 16. Again, I'm using the New King James translation. Please follow along as I read. Jude, chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not keep their proper or their own domain, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Verse 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Verse 8, Likewise, also, these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Look also in verse 11. Woe to them! For they have gone in the way of Cain, run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by winds. Late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Verse 14. Now Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all or convince all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Verse 16 concludes our reading. It says, these are murmurers, complainers, walking according to their own lust, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. We trust that God will add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray just once more together. Father, as we find our hearts in your presence, we pray, O oh God, speak to us through your word, by your spirit, guiding us into all truth, we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, the exposing of false teachers is one that is absolutely needed in our day and time, as it was in Jude's time. As you remember, he had a desire to write about the common salvation, that which we share in common one with another in the fellowship of God's Spirit together. But as he was pressed to write duty-bound, 
He brought before us last night in verses two through four, the doctrine of ungodliness, the distortion of the gospel, and the denial of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the very beginning of the messages of false teachers that live in our day. This morning, starting in verse four, he's going to bring before us that which exposes them, but he begins with their doom. I think this is important because we know what the bottom line is, that the secrets of men's hearts will be revealed and judged according to God's righteous judgment. They may think that they have the final word, but God has the final word. And so we begin with their doom. Someone said, whenever the devil reminds you of your past, you just remind him of his future. <laughs> that there is coming a judgment. And so we begin with that doom in mind, and as you've noticed, we end with that final judgment when the Lord comes. So we start with verse 4, and specifically starting in verse 5, I'm sorry. We're going to start with verse 5 and specifically look at their doom and to describe the doom that is ahead for false teachers. Jude very wisely goes back to the past and he uses, through these verses we've read from verses 5 through 16, seven different examples. Now we talked about triplets last time. Triplets, of course, three, that's the number of perfection, isn't it? He's going to take seven different examples from the Old Testament. Seven, that's the number of completeness. I tell you, we've got a perfect book before us, don't we? It's the Word of God. It's perfect in every way. Every word is tested and proven, settled forever in heaven. And so whether you're talking about three, the perfect number, or seven, the complete number, we know we've got a perfect book, and it's a complete book. It gives us all the revelation we could ever need from God. Nothing yet is going to be added to it. Nothing should be ever taken away from it. We have the written word of God perfect in every way. And so we just mentioned, and we'll be looking at one by one, the seven different examples from the Old Testament. It starts, of course, with Israel, also the fallen angels in Genesis chapter 6, the sad state of Sodom and Gomorrah. We even look back at Michael the archangel and the death and burial of Moses. We'll look at Cain, as we mentioned briefly last night. There's more to say about Cain. And Balaam, the prophet. And then lastly, Korah and the rebellion that he was part of. So we're gonna look at those seven examples from the Old Testament, but we're still going to stay in the form of triplets, if you will, because here in the doom that's mentioned, verses five through seven, we start in verse five, as we've read, I read it again, no apology for the repetition. The more we can hear the word of God, the better. It takes a long time, doesn't it, for it to sink in. How many times have you read the Bible? Some of you have read it 25 times, 50 times, 100 times. I remember when I started in ministry, I met a brother who said, he never speaks on anything till he reads it 100 times. He said, I'm glad I didn't meet you when I started. <laughs> I hardly understood what anything meant. Do you know the Lord helps us as we read and reread? I like what one brother said, you know, the Bible doesn't need to be retranslated, it just needs to be reread. And we need to read it over and over and over again and ask God to reveal to us the message that's here. And so in verse five, when we read and read again, verse five, it takes us all the way back to what happened with the Israelites who came out of bondage, out of Egypt. And here he says, I want to remind you though you once knew this. You know, a lot of us have forgotten a lot of what we know. We need to be reminded, don't we? Simon Peter had that ministry. He said, I want to stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. One time I spoke on the ministry of reminding and somebody said, you reminded me of things I never even knew. Is that possible? We do have a good forgetter. Our problem is we remember the things we should forget. And we forget the things we should remember. And so Jude, as he starts, he says, I'm going to remind you of something you once knew. What happens? We get comfortable, we grow slothful, we need to read the word, 
reread it, be reminded of it, and stirred up. And so he says, I'm going to write you and remind you about something that you used to know. That the Lord, here's the key, having saved his people, be careful here, not necessarily referring to eternal salvation here, but deliverance. He delivered his people, where from? Out of the land of Egypt. It's not just coming out, is it, to be saved, but it's also going in. Could it be that some, and the ones that he uses as an example, were delivered out of bondage of Egypt, but not from their sin, just out of slavery? The very dangerous thing, isn't it, when we are exposed to the truth, and we may know it, but Peter warns, for those who know the truth, but do not put their trust in Christ, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of truth. How can that be? But in that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And his response is, depart from me, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Oh, they may have professed to know him, but it's not that they could profess to know him, but that they are known of him. Now that's salvation. That relationship, by putting my trust in Christ, I come to know him. Whom to know is life eternal. This is eternal life. But not only that we know him, but that he knows us. And so here we see that they were delivered out of Egypt, but they never made it into the promised land. We've been delivered from sin. We've been translated or transferred from the kingdom of darkness. But don't stop there into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Now that's a full salvation, isn't it? Not just knowing it in my head, but believing it in my heart. Huh? How many people will miss heaven by 18 inches? They know the answers, but they don't know the Lord. They know the words, but they don't have Him. And so he starts with this first example of those who came out of Egypt but the end of verse 5 says, they were destroyed. He destroyed those who did not believe. The only way in is by faith. Believing. Taking God at his word. For without faith, help me out here, it is impossible to please God. Impossible. He doesn't say, without faith, you really have to work hard. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, but he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so the very first example is the destruction of those who are false professors, but not possessors of eternal life. It's a warning to the false teachers, but that's just warning number one. You know, some of the Israelites, they were destroyed at the border. When they sent in the spies, 10 were bad and two were good. And they took the 10 over the two. No wonder Joshua, when he sent spies in, he said, let's just send two. That's the best way, isn't it? And when God said, you know, because you said you can't overcome them, you're going to be in the wilderness for 40 years. And then a group of them said, well, we'll go on in now. And God said, I'm not going with you. You're on your own. Don't go. And they were destroyed. Later, they were destroyed by the sword. When the law was given, about 3,000 were slain, laid low in the wilderness. Aren't you glad for that great contrast? That when the law was given through Moses, 3,000 slain. But when grace was announced on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 saved. Which one would you like? That's an easy choice, isn't it? The Israelites, they craved meat and they said, give us meat to eat. And God gave them so much meat, he said, it'll come out of your nostrils. And while the meat was still between their teeth, the anger of the Lord came up against them and they were slain by the pestilence. They died. And then they rebelled against the Lord again and the Lord put fiery serpents to bite them. He told Moses to put a brazen serpent up on a pole. And if they would just look, they would live. But many died by the fiery serpents. 
It's amazing that the Lord Jesus used that serpent on a pole. As Moses lift the serpent, lifted the serpent on the pole, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is what we're talking about. He makes it simple enough for a child to understand and profound enough that it holds our attention even into our later years. What a great God we know. How good it is to know Him and to be known by Him. But the false teachers who know not the Savior, they have a doom to look forward to, just like Israel did. And the generation was destroyed all over the age of 20. They came out of bondage, out of Egypt, but they did not come into the promised land except for two who believed, Joshua and Caleb, those two good spies. The second generation, or the second example that we have is in verse six. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness and for the judgment of the great day. Genesis chapter 6 tells the sad story, doesn't it? That the thoughts and intents of the heart of man were only evil continually. And the Lord was grieved that he had ever created man. What led up to this great grief and sadness and this awful sinfulness? Well, sin had entered the world and death by sin, even to where the angelic realms were affected through Satan as Lucifer who rebelled against the Lord and with him brought a third of his angels and they looked on the daughters of men and they left their domain and cohabited with men. These things are mysteries to us, aren't they? But the bottom line is this, that when they sinned and rebelled against the Lord in this way, God put them in the very blackness of darkness reserved for the day of judgment. Now, there are three words in the New Testament used for what we refer to as hell. Presently, Hades is the place of the departed who know not the Savior. One day, hell, the lake of fire will be seen and has been prepared or will be prepared for whom? for the devil and his angels. I believe it's right to say God never intended a human being to be into hell. He did everything necessary to warn us and to win us from the terrible eternal destruction that goes on forever and ever. But those angels, they're not just in Hades and in hell. There was another place, Peter mentions it in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, and he says, well, the name Tataris or Tataro was like being put under the very blackness of darkness in a place that's reserved for those who rebel against the Lord among the angelic realms, that they're bound with chains, and they'll be held there until that great final day of judgment. An amazing thing, isn't it? In these areas... While they're mysteries to us, we read it and we realize that just as with the children of Israel, who were not believers, they were destroyed because of their unbelief. And these angels who rebelled against the Lord, they were bound and are bound right now in chains waiting that coming judgment. It's judgment for them. It's their doom. And thirdly, he mentions in verse 7, words that are so familiar to us about Sodom and Gomorrah. When I just mentioned the words, as we have in verse 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah, our mind immediately knows what happened in history. Sodom and Gomorrah are mentioned in the scriptures ten times, and every time it's associated with the evil, the immorality, and the wickedness of that terrible place. It's amazing that Lot would lift his eyes toward the east and would end up resettling in Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, Abraham, he, well, he pitched his tent and he built an altar. Someone said, Lot, he pitched the altar and built his tent. He lived in a house in Sodom. 
and Sodom is known historically because of their wickedness. Not only known in history, but known in heaven. The Lord told Abraham, a cry has come up from Sodom unto me. The Lord was aware of the wickedness in Sodom and he sent two angelic witnesses to see if these things were true. And he brought about the destruction of this place, even as we read, as Sodom and Gomorrah in verse seven and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality. But it wasn't just the sexual immorality. You and I remember from the, the true events that happened from the book of Genesis, it was the homosexuality, it was their pride, Ezekiel explains to us, their fullness of food, the abundance of idleness, that they were lifted up and thought they could never be destroyed by the Lord. But they were known in history. They were known in heaven. But Jude 7 says, they're known in hell. Look what we read. Because of their immorality and gone after strange flesh, they are set forth as an example, and the end of verse 7 reminds us, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And the Lord Jesus warned, as it was in the days of Lot, the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be in the day of the coming of the Son of Man. Are we not living in those days right now? Will it get worse than it is right now? This is a global situation we see of immorality, just generally speaking. I mentioned last night, not only is the world accepting it, but they want the church to be accepting of it as well. Not only do they want us to be accepting of that lifestyle, they want us not just to accept it, but to embrace it. And that's not enough either. They want us not only to accept it and to embrace it, but to promote it. And many Christians that are naive are being swayed by the world and the influences there. It's no wonder that Jude uses these three sad, sad examples as references of doom that await false teachers that are leading the people of God astray. No wonder we need the warning. I also want to say this, that those who are lost and wandering aimlessly in life in the immorality of our age, there's still hope, there's a way out. They can come out of this bondage. I've heard testimony after testimony of those who were lost in all of the degradation of sin. We read in the book of Romans chapter one, verses 24, 26, and 28, that God gave them up, that God gave them up, that God gave them over. And while he gave them up, I wanna tell you, he never gave up on them. For God so loved the world, a world full of sinners just like me and all of us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is a way back. There is a way out. But in the way that stays in this lost state is the way of doom. And so for these first three examples, did I tell you that you'd like triplets? Of course I did. We see these three sad, sad examples. Israel and their unbelief, fallen angels bound in the blackness of darkness reserved for judgment, and ungodly people of Sodom suffering the fire that fell from heaven, but representing the eternal fire that is yet in store for those who reject the Savior. Yes, hell is made for the devil and his angels. But for those who reject the Savior, they make their own choice. That's where I'll go. I want nothing to do with God, and there's only one other place. You know, it's either heaven or hell. There's no in-between. And God has established it this way, that the gospel has been revealed from heaven, available to all. But the wrath of God is also revealed against all those who reject God's wonderful way of salvation. We not only see the doom of false teachers, 
But we see their dreams. Look at verse 8, if you will. Verse 8 look, makes the connection from verses 5, 6, and 7. And verse 8 makes everything that we've talked about up to this point makes the direct connection to false teachers. Don't miss it, please. It's one of those little words sometimes we can slip over and just not even notice it. It's the word likewise, also. Likewise, also these dreamers. They're living in a fantasy world. Let's establish what the fantasy world is. They're only living for what they can see and touch and know right now. Paul says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men the most pitiable. This is not reality, what we see and touch. That's all in the feeling world, the soulish world. But the real reality is that which is eternal, the great unseen. Which world are you living for? That's the ultimate question. Are you living a dream? That's what the world wants to do. They're, they're living the dream. And these dreamers, what do they dream about? I'm so glad that the Word of God is, is very proper. But you and I can read between the lines to understand the meaning of these things. And so Jude gives us, you guessed it, he gives us another triplet. And the triplet begins with the dreams. They're dreaming of the defilement of the flesh. They defile the flesh. Yet, likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh. What does it mean? Well, they come out defecting, deforming, and to defile is actually to twist and use for the wrong purpose. That which is natural, they don't want it. But they go for that which is unnatural, part of this ungeneration we mentioned yesterday. And they take love, which is a great gift from the Lord. Not just His love for us, but our love for Him. We love Him, why? Because He first loved us. And they turn it into idolatry. Not just his love for us and our love for him, but our love one for another in a family way. Husbands and wives are to love one another. You know what the dreamers here have done? They've defiled the flesh and they've turned love into lust and do the very things that it was never intended for. God says these dreamers, first of all, they defile the flesh. What does this say? It's saying that false teachers are in it for what they get out of it, of self-gratification through sensuality and sexuality, of a moral nature. We, we don't want to be so blunt and more explicit than this. But you and I know what goes on in our world. We don't want to know it all. But the little bit we know, we realize, man has given himself to many devices and the defilement of all that is good that God created us for. God is a good God. He's good to the just and to the unjust. And the unjust take all of his goodness and they twist it and they make it a filthy thing. Literally to defile means to stain with sin. All the good things that God has given. It's amazing, isn't it? Now, you know, it's only by the grace of God we're not there. It would be us both feet into this world if it had not been for the marvelous grace of our loving Lord. And we say, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift to save us out of this bondage. And yet we recognize that's exactly what the false teachers are bringing the believers that are naive, that are weighed down with the guilt and a load of sin and they're being led astray. No wonder the warning is here. So he says, likewise, these dreamers not only defile the defilement of the flesh, but they also have a, a disregard for authority. They reject authority. What God had intended when he put the powers of this world into place, like Romans chapter 13, do you know that the governments and those who keep our law and order are ministers of God put in place by the Lord? And you say, wait a minute, you don't know the administration that I live under. No, no. 
It's true. If it's not, then how could we ever explain how God could take from his people from the land of Israel over into Babylon, where Nebuchadnezzar reigned, and after him, one after another, despots, who were wicked men. Daniel says he raises up from the basest of men to put him over the people. Who raises them up? Is that true in the year 2019? We know it is. God teaches us lessons. Someone said, uh, when God puts rulers over us, it's, it's what we need. It's not what we like, but it's what we need. And he can use even the vilest man who's in office for his purposes and good. And it was through the one that God raised up that the children of Israel were able to depart from Babylon after 70 years and go all the way back to the land of promise. It's remarkable, isn't it? He not only sent them back, he provided the funds and the food and everything they would need to rebuild the temple. Now that is amazing grace, isn't it? And so the false teachers, their characteristic is they reject rulers or authorities and God says, don't do it. Not only that, but take it one more step. They have a disrespect, or they speak evil, of dignitaries. I'd like to take that dignitaries and advance it from just in this world of leadership that God has put us in. But let's raise up the bar a little bit and realize we're talking even of the dignitaries that are heavenly dignitaries, such as the different realms of angels, principalities and powers and might and all of the offices, these false teachers, they're not afraid to speak evil of them, even of the ultimate dignitary in all the universe. And man in all of our littleness could speak words that would even blaspheme the name of God Most High. It's amazing, isn't it? What's amazing to me is God's restraint. He's so patient. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God, he hears not only the words of their mouths, but the murmuring of their hearts, and he restrains the judgment and his wrath. But we see the false teachers, they're dreamers. All they dream about is defiling the flesh. They have a disregard for authority that has been put into place by God himself and a disrespect for dignitaries. He goes on to tell us about those who speak evil of dignitaries in verse 9. And the example that we pick out is from Michael the archangel in contending with the devil, the arch enemy, when he disputed about the body of Moses. And we think, wait, what was this? It's not in our Old Testament, is it? But other writings, like the book of Enoch, perhaps, I'm not sure, but other writings are quoted sometimes in the Bible. Paul quoted from one of the poets of the Cretans. Here he says that Michael the archangel contended, here's our same word, to contend for the faith. He contended, he disputed with the arch enemy, Satan, over the body of Moses. And what do we know about the body of Moses? The only thing we know about the body of Moses is that God buried him. And where did he bury him? All we know it's in the Valley of Moab. The Valley of Moab. Why would he bury him in secret? Well, I don't have any doubt about it. I think we all know that if they could have kept the body of Moses as a shrine, they would have idolized the body just like they did with a brazen serpent on the pole. And they started following after it in idolatry. They hushed him. They would have done the same for the body of Moses. It's no wonder that Satan wanted the body of Moses. Perhaps because he thinks he's over the realm of the dead, because he held us all of our lifetime subject to bondage, to the fear of death, but we've been set free from the fear of death 
and we have no fear of it. He has no power over us now because we've been delivered from his power. The Lord Jesus Christ is victorious over sin, death, and hell. But in that day, Jude says, listen, when Michael, do you know his name means, who is like the Most High? When he disputed with Satan, Lucifer, who himself said, I will be like the Most High. But even Michael the Archangel, who is like God Most High, would not even bring a railing accusation of judgment against the devil. But what did he say? It tells us in verse 9, you want to make a note for your own personal combat? Here's the note you should make. Don't go about rebuking the devil. Now, he has no power over us, but he can certainly attack Outside of the grace of God, we're no match for him. But greater is he who is in me and in you than he who is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. That's the Christian's 44, isn't it? Greater is he who is in me and you than he who is in the world. We don't go after the devil. I, when I hear some televangelists tell me about how they had bound the devil, I think, you know, only God can do that. And how they rebuke the devil and tell the devil, I wouldn't even talk to him. What does the Bible say? Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw near unto God and he'll draw near unto you. That's your safest place. Stay close to the Lord. The Lord Jesus warned Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as weak. But I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. We have one praying for us. Jesus Christ the righteous at the right hand of the throne of God, and he is making intercession for us to keep us safe from even the devil and all of his emissaries. If Michael the archangel, who's more powerful than all the other angels, and for you and me, in comparison, if he did not bring a railing accusation of judgment against the devil, who would we ever think we could be? And here's what Michael said. The Lord rebuke you. And that's what we say to you. Amen? Amen. The Lord rebuke you. Someone said, when, when the devil keeps attacking, you just say, Lord, the devil is messing with your stuff. <laughs> and he'll take care of the rest. Yet, these false teachers, they're not afraid to speak. What do they speak? Well, in verse 10, it tells us what they speak. Look at what we see. It says, but these speak evil of what they do not know. And that, that is a puzzlement, isn't it? How long can you talk about something you don't know about? Well, they evidently could hold forth for a long time. And into realms that go from the sublime to the ridiculous, they always have something to say. And they're talking about things that they don't know Eternal matters, they have no insight into eternal matters. And yet, they hold forth and people listen to them. I heard of one false teacher and a person who went to their meeting. And they said, how was the meeting with that teacher? And they said, oh, it was amazing. It was wonderful. They said, what did he say? I didn't understand a thing. It was so wonderful. <laughs> May it not be that way among us. May we speak words that are clearly understood. We're not looking for speaking in languages that cannot be uttered. And yet, false teachers, they can go long and hard about matters that they do not even know about. But what do they do? Look what he says. That's what you don't want to do. Don't speak about what you don't know. But here's what they do. Verse 10, again in the middle of the verse. And whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Again, we're back into the area of sexual immorality. And the bestiality of immorality is there. Again, we're careful in our terminologies, aren't we? We don't want to know any more than this. We just know that we live in a very wicked world. And 
The world has cast off the restraints that God put there for a reason, for our own protection. And because of the rebellion, Romans 1 makes it clear, they receive in themselves the just recompense of their deeds. And that many, while they may not do what the world does, they look on, not only with acceptance, but with agreement. The Bible warns us, have nothing to do with them. And he goes on to explain, while they're speaking evil of what they don't know, they are experts in what they do. And they corrupt themselves completely. And so we see their doom, their dreams. And verse 11 brings us into their deception. How powerful are they? So much so that now they're elevated to the level where the Lord pronounces through the book of Jude, a woe to them. You know, the Lord Jesus, he pronounced woes. He pronounced woes to the scribes, to the Pharisees, hypocrites, he said. They want to appear to be something, but inwardly they are not. They appear as sheep on the outside, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. Woe to the scribes and to the Pharisees, to the hypocrites. He even names places. Woe unto you, Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum, because he was there and ministered among them, and yet they did not believe. Woe to them. And in the book of Revelation, woe, 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 a threefold woe. And here he opens it again in verse 11, and he says, woe to them. Why? Well, because their doom is sure. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Wrote Martin Luther. And here we are in this world with devils filled that threaten to undo us. We will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. Yes, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. How's the rest of it go? And we must win the battle. The bottom line, the final word is their doom. Woe to them. Why? He goes back to his Old Testament imagery again. And the last three of those seven images from the Old Testament now are brought before us, first of all, to identify, to expose false teachers, first of all, by comparison. Then we're going to identify these false teachers by their character. And lastly, with the Lord's help, we'll identify them by their conduct. First of all, in verse 11, we identify them by comparison. And three examples from the Old Testament are given to us to make a comparison. The very first one, they have gone in the way of Cain. Now that's the first one. Secondly, they have run greedily in the era of Balaam for profit. And thirdly, they have perished in the rebellion of Korah. Those three, think about them for just a moment. First of all, we see the rejection of the way of Cain. He rejected God's way of salvation, and remember, from Genesis and also from last night. How Abel brought a blood sacrifice, a firstling of his flock, and God accepted Abel's sacrifice. It was offered by faith, meaning it was offered according to the prescribed way as written in the Word of God. Through the example that we have with Adam and Eve, and when the, the appointed time came, God had evidently given instructions, maybe not contained in the Scriptures, but certain instructions, that there's a time that I want you to bring an offering, and that offering should be an offering of blood. Abel brought the first thing of his flock, a blood sacrifice. Cain, he brought the first fruits of, the, of his labor. You know, I believe the first man-made religion was a fig leaf religion, don't you? Adam and Eve, they made themselves clothing out of fig leaves. A fig leaf religion works. The second man-made religion is Cain. He brought the fruit of his labor. Works. We learn something about man-made religion, don't we? When it comes right down to it, the bottom line of man-made religion is what? Works! I talked to a man one time 
at a funeral for his aunt who was a believer. His great aunt, a wonderful believer, but her great nephew, he wasn't too great. He was educated, an intellectual in this world, and when I talked to him about the gospel before the funeral, he said, you know, I've been studying religions lately. And I said, well, that's interesting. I'm sure you found out they're all pretty much the same. He said, yes, as a matter of fact, I have. I said, well, that's the big difference, you know. And I waited. And he said, what difference? I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> you know, sometimes we need to wait for the question before we give them the answer. And I said, well, that's the great difference between the truth of salvation by grace through faith and religion, man's own attempts to bind himself back to God. That all the religions of the world, when you boil them down, they all come right down to works. But salvation is of the Lord. He did the work and he finished it completely. He said from the cross, it is finished. Done is the work that saves. Done every bit. Aren't you glad for that? I need to ask that question one more time. Aren't you glad for that? If it was something we had to do, we could never earn merit or inherit God's great gift, free gift of eternal salvation. But he has done it all. What does he ask us to do? Receive it by faith. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling, to the finished work of Jesus Christ. What is this way of Cain? It's a religion. Proverbs warns, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but its end is destruction. They have followed the way of Cain. They're earning their own way to heaven. They won't make it. It's impossible to please God without faith. And they had a faithless religion based on works. Secondly, they have gone and run greedily into the error of Balaam. And he was the prophet that God had to restrain the prophet in his madness. A dumb donkey speaking to him. I tell you, the donkey knew more than Balaam. <laughs> you better listen to his donkey. What was Balaam all about? Well, God restrained the madness of the prophet so that even though he was hired, he was a prophet for hire, he was hired by Balak to curse the children of Israel every time he looked at him, at Israel, from any different perspective, and he opened his mouth, it all came out as blessing. And even prophesied about the coming of Messiah, a star coming out of Jacob. I see him, but not near. I know him, but... Far off, and Balaam, what a disgrace, a prophet for hire. You know, <laughs> the modern day prophets are nothing but profiteers. You gotta change the spelling, you understand. They spell prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T. Somebody asked me <laughs> the other day, I said, so what, what is your church all about? You have prophets there? I said, no, we're a non-profit organization. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm so glad that the apostles and prophets are settled. It's, they've, they've been built on the foundation, which is Christ and none other. And upon the prophets and the apostles and the prophets, now we're being built up. That foundation is what? Not the apostles and the prophets themselves but the apostles who were messengers of the Lord Jesus and the prophets who pointed to Christ. And he is the foundation. But Balaam, he's a warning, isn't he? That those who have the privilege of ministering the word, and we don't hire out for profit. Balaam, well, he could not curse the children of Israel. He could only bless them. And Balak said, I hired you to curse them and you blessed them. And now they're blessed. And Balaam said, yeah, but I got a better way. You can bring down this people by their sensuality and their immorality and their fleshly desires. And they expose them to the daughters of Moab. And the rest is history. 
When you see money, you're going to find immorality, whenever that becomes the goal. And he warns, that's what these false teachers are doing. They're just making merchandise of you. Don't follow their way. Don't follow their error of Balaam. You know, later the error of Balaam becomes the doctrine of Balaam in the book of Revelation chapter 2. And they study it well, that doctrine. How to make merchandise. I don't know about you, but the telephone at our assembly, we have a message machine. And we're always getting messages of how to raise funds in the church. I like the old way, don't you? God's work done God's way never lacks God's supply. He has shown us over and over and over again that his grace is sufficient to provide all that we need. We don't have to beg for money. We don't have to make our needs known except to him. And he hears in secret, and he's a very gracious and generous, loving father who provides all that we need, and even more. How do I know that? Well, Romans chapter 8, verse 32 says, God who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? We have been blessed, and we have all things richly to enjoy. Vance Havner says, what's the devil going to do with a man like me? He says, if you serve me, I'll give you everything you could ever want. He says, I've already gotten all things richly to enjoy. And then he threatens me and says, I'll take everything away. And Vance Havner says, he just says, you know, I've already suffered the loss of all things that I may gain Christ. <laughs> what's the devil going to do with a man like me? Don't let him trick you. These false teachers are saying, you know, it's good to serve the Lord, but you can make some money in this. And that's what Balaam was all about. How? Bringing about the downfall of the people of God in the Old Testament. And you think that's not happening today? It's rampant. We need to stay clear and separate from all of this. That we might please him who enlisted us in his army as good soldiers of Christ Jesus. Well, this comes to the third way to identify by comparison. Not only the way of Cain and also the era of Balaam, but also the rebellion or gainsaying. That's a direct transliterated expression. They were speaking against the rebellion of Korah was speaking against Moses and Aaron. Now, Korah was a great grandson of Levi. And he had some responsibilities, and so did his particular family, that had to do with the service of the tabernacle. But he wasn't satisfied to serve. He wanted to be in charge. And he says, Moses, you and Aaron, you take too much on yourselves. He says, we're just as much priest as you are. And God says, you call all the family of Korah out, Dathan and Abiram together, and you have them all come out, and we'll, I'll show you what's going to happen. And Moses warned the people, and what happened? The earth opened up and swallowed them alive, right down into hell, the Bible says they went. Are there rebels? Yes, there are. False teachers who by still come in among the flock of God, and by gainsaying, by rumors and talking, can subvert even whole local assemblies, bringing disregard for the authority that God has raised up called elders, who serve by example and yet are undermined just by words. Now, if this happened with false teachers, we want to be very careful. Why do you think Jews writing to believers about this? Not just to expose false teachers, but also to give us a warning and an exhortation, he says, that we are careful not to follow their ways. Don't follow the way of Cain. Don't run greedily after the error of Balaam. And whatever you do, don't fall into the rebellion, the gainsaying of Korah. We can, we can identify them. The Bible exposes them by comparison, those three comparisons right there. In verses 12 and 13, he now identifies them and exposes them 
by their character as well as comparison. Now this is a great help to us here because the, just while Cain, well, he rejected God on the basis of salvation and Balaam, he rejected God's way concerning separation and sanctification and Korah, he rejected God's way of service. When we come to identifying their character, look at what we read. We're gonna find five examples here. I'm sorry, it's not three. Five examples here that are, are images that speak volumes to us just by reading their words. Notice please in verse 12 and 13, here's what he says. First of all, there are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear, serving themselves, only serving themselves. Love feasts are great, aren't they? Some people spell fellowship F-O-O-D. And false teachers love fellowship dinners. And in other words, they're in it just for what they can fill their stomachs with. And you know it's important, isn't it, for elders not to go first in line at the fellowship dinner, right? We're not in it for what we can eat. <laughs> but these false teachers, they just, they were getting fat off of God's people. They were shepherds, literally it says, who were just feeding off the flock. Jacob, he was a good shepherd, he said, I never ate a lamb. But even the ones that were torn by beasts, I replaced them myself and brought them back to Laban. He's a good shepherd, doesn't he? The Lord Jesus is even a better shepherd. It wasn't that the sheep gave themselves for him, but he gave himself for the sheep. But these, they're spots. Literally, it means that they're hidden reefs or rocks in the ocean. I've been down in the Bahamas before, and while we're going in low tide, you can see all the rocks sticking up out of the water. You come back in the high tide, you think, where are the rocks? We can't see them. That's exactly what false teachers do. They're just under the surface. And you can't spot them, but you can spot them this way. They're self-serving. They're spots. And they show up especially whenever there's something to gain from the people of God. Here, the illustration is food. And it's an apt illustration. They love the self-service line. Not only that, the second image is there are clouds without water. You remember the drought that you had here in Texas a few years ago. And the clouds would come, and we'd get our hopes up, and the clouds would go. And that's what false prophet teachers are like. They come offering so much, they look laden and heavy with blessings. And we're waiting for the showers of blessing. But after they dispense what they had, there was nothing there. Thirdly, he says, Again in verse 12, they are trees, late autumn trees without fruit. I like this, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. There's no fruit. There's no root. And that's why there's no fruit. Twice dead. I like simple math, don't you? If you're born one time, you're gonna die twice. If you're born twice, you only got to die once. You follow me on that? You might need a calculator. <laughs> if you're born once, you're going to die twice. That's what happened here. These were unbelievers, the false teachers. And we're not talking of someone that just gets it a little wrong. They're set out for teaching false doctrine. They're born once, they're going to die twice. They're twice dead. And that's why there's no fruit, because there's no root. But we who've been born twice, we might only have to die once. And that's just a maybe. I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. I wouldn't mind stepping once in this world and the next one right up into glory. But these false teachers, they're like spots in the feast. They're like empty clouds. They're like trees with no fruit. Fourthly, they're like the raging, verse 13 tells us, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. <laughs> They're going back and forth. That's exactly what he says. You're tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of doctrine. 
It's so confusing and chaotic. The only thing they offer up is what? Filthy foam. They're all fluff and no substance. And then fifthly, he said they're wandering stars, like comets or meteors. They're not stable. You can't plot your course by them. I like God's GPS, don't you? The GPS. God's plan of salvation. That's the best kind of direction you can get from here, earth, to heaven. But if you're following a wandering star, you're going to be wandering too. They're wandering stars. And then we see in those five images that we identify by character, their self-serving ways, their emptiness, their deadness, their foam and rage, and the wandering nature. Don't follow them. You can know the character of the false teacher. And we come lastly, we know them by their conduct. And we expose their conduct, and verses 14 through 16 lay it out so plainly for us. Now Enoch, he's the seventh generation from Adam. What do we remember about Enoch in the book of Genesis? Enoch, what? Walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. We know his walk. Did you know he not only walked with God, he also talked for God? Jude is the one that tells us in verse 14, he prophesied about these men also. And this is what he said, Behold, the Lord is coming with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all. Why? Well, here's their conduct. He's going to convince and convict all who are ungodly. That's their conduct. They have an ungodly conduct. Notice all the times it uses ungodly in verse 15. He convinced them of their ungodly, all those who were ungodly, among them all, of their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. He hears it. He records it. And payment will be made in that day of judgment. Enoch, he walked with God. He talked for God. And he reminds the people then, and even to this very day, the Lord is coming. And in the exposure of false teachers, he says, judgment day is coming. Why? Well, here's their conduct. With all their ungodliness, speaking against him at the end of verse 15, he tells us in verse 16, they're murmurers. That's what they say in their heart. They had a heart murmur. And God hears it. They're complainers. That's what they say with their mouth. They're walking. That's what they say with their feet. According to their own lust. That's what they say with their own desires. And they mouth great swelling words. They have pompous words. And flattery. To do what? Here's the bottom line of their conduct. Just to take advantage. You and I have been warned. Don't fall for it. We know all about their doom. We ought to know all about their dreams. And now we know all about their deception. I'll mention one more time. You know, he doesn't say anything about their names. Wouldn't you like to know who they were? No. Because if you knew them by name, we live in a day where they've changed the names. But let me help you. The new age that we have among us today is nothing but the old lie with a different name. Satan said, and you'll be like God. The new age says, you are God's. Don't fall for it. The book of Ephesians says, we are to take the light of God's word and shine it and expose their deeds so that we'll all know it. By comparison from the Bible, what they are. By their very character of being self-seeking and self-merchandising on the people of God. And by their own conduct. If you know the word of God, you can spot them and you can expose them a mile away.
May the Lord strengthen us and take this exhortation to our hearts for his own glory and honor. Our brother's going to close in prayer this time.